Great. Great. So next talk is on random pitch on changes in non-polar, uh, non-bipolar field structure over the final place to see new patterns, the results of Hawaii, and that's a really great sense. Yeah, that's that's a very paper title or yeah. a talk title. <laughs> But um, yeah, this is this is something that's in front. So I'm going to talk today a bit uh, about uh, some work that I did uh, for my PhD while I was at Scripps. Um, uh, but I'm currently at the University of Liverpool, so I just wanted to put both those affiliations on here. Um, so so the, the general problem um, that I'm dealing with this in this paper is that when you look at reconstructions of the time average geomagnetic fields, and you look at paleomagnetic directions, um, things look fairly close to dipolar. So this is uh, the LM3 model that Jeff Cromwell uh, made in uh, 2018. And there's sort of a little bit of asymmetry, a little bit of a quadrupolar component to this, but um, to first order, it's pretty dipolar. Um, however, um, if you look at the time average geomagnetic field with intensities, the picture is, is very different. So this is a plot of all of the time average, or sorry, all of the paleo intensities that are in magic over the last 5 million years. So the sort of blue shapes here represent the distributions of paleo intensities, the widths of those uh, plots uh, represent the, the number of paleo intensities at that value. Um, and the yellow stars are the averages at those latter, in those latitude bins. And the expected distribution of paleo intensities and latitude for dipole fields of different strengths are plotted as the red, black, and blue lines. Uh, and you can see that there's not much correspondence to any one particular um, dipole field. And in fact, sort of modeling that people have done for how how much of a quadrupole field or how much of an octopole field you would need to make the distribution of pale intensities that are observed in global databases are sort of on the order of 15 to 30 percent which is just not what you see when you look at directions so there's clearly some kind of mismatch here um, so i sort of have thought about this about what could cause this a bit um, and so I, I in this paper I sort of came up with three possible hypotheses for this so the first one is that the paleo intensity data that we have in the database are treated very differently. Uh, they're produced using different methods. Uh, they're analyzed differently. And our understanding has changed in the last 50 or so years that people have been producing these. And so some of the stuff that's older um, may not be as reliable as some of the stuff that we've done more recently. Um, and so, it's, it's hard to quantify what you're comparing here. Uh, the second problem, which I think is, is quite important with looking at paleo intensities like this, is that at different latitudes, looking at these latitude bins, we're looking at a time average over the last 5 million years. But depending on the rocks that exist at that latitude, uh, you're going to have different age distributions. So here's a plot of the same thing, but at, on the bottom here, it's age and the distribution of ages in all of these bins. And you can see that different latitudes have wildly varying uh, distributions of ages in these, in these bins. Um, in particular, I just sort of uh, wanted to point out that some of these, these bins where you have slightly higher values, so closer to this uh, 80 zeta amp meter squared line, the red line here, um, you often, these are in these sort of low northern hemisphere latitudes. And these are often things where you have more data from the past 1 million years. Um, and so it's not directly comparable to stuff like the data in Antarctica, 80 degrees south. Uh, I should use this mouse to point at things. Yeah. Use the laptop mouse. OK. So uh, yeah, so this, this bin here, um, where you, you're kind of more representative of this whole time period. Um, and then the third reason that you could have, have this problem is that you have some real non-dipole behavior that's some, for some reason being captured more strongly in the intensities than in the directions. Um, and that doesn't seem particularly plausible for the 15 to 30%, but it, it might have an effect with some combination of, of these effects. Um, so 
the sort of motivation to go to Hawaii to collect data is that Hawaii has is one of these places where we have a lot of data in the past one million years. And then before that, there's uh, not a lot, and in particular, not a lot of stuff that was uh, collected recently. Most of the stuff comes from the 80s. Um, so I went ahead and did some field work in Hawaii. So what we did is we, we targeted uh, rapidly cooled fine grain materials like uh, chill dike margins, lava flow tops and bottoms, and what I'm calling vent deposits, which covers actually a whole load of lithologies, but things like cinder and satiphones, particularly, but some sort of agglutinated things and other odd things as well. Um, and these materials are sort of uh, less likely, we think, to contain magnetic carriers with non-ideal domain states, which is a very vague statement because I don't want to get into a big debate about which particular carriers have non-ideal domain states. But you know, things that are very fine-grained, I think most people would agree, are likely to be good recorders of paleo intensities. Um, so uh, this is where we went to. This is a very complicated figure, but basically the point is that the places in the boxes are where we sampled from and went to seven volcanoes on four different islands. And that gives us pretty nice coverage over the past four million years. Um, so we collected a load of unoriented samples from Hawaii. Uh, and one of the advantages to doing this is it's, it's quicker to collect more samples and although you don't get directions out of it, uh, it's a lot easier to get permission from people to sample things when you're not drilling. Um, so then I went ahead and did about 600 Izzy Tellier experiments um, and I analyzed them using my BICEP method, which I presented, I think, two years ago at Magnetic Interaction. So the idea behind this is that you fit circles um, to get the curvature parameter um, to your RI plots. And you then sort of look at the, the relationship between curvature and the paleo intensity that you get um, for your individual specimens. Uh, you fit lines to it, and this is all done in a sort of Monte Carlo approach, so you get an uncertainty. Um, and the points where those lines cross the zero curvature axis, where we think that the result should be unbiased, um, is the paleo intensity uh, result that you get for the site. Um, and the reason that uh, we use this was because uh, with this method, 31 of our sites passed. Um, and with the Cromwell criteria, which are quite strict and were being used at Scripps for only 21 of the sites passed. So it's a significant improvement. <coughs> but uh, in the BICEP paper, we demonstrated that the level of accuracy is basically the same as the Cromwell criteria. Um, and actually, this is believe it or not, a specimen which failed the Cromwell criteria. Uh, it has a beautiful RO plot, but the reason it fails is that not quite enough of the magnetization vector is being used. It's something like 77% instead of 78% that are required. So yeah, <laughs> so this is what, why I, I prefer to use BICEP for this. So some observations that I, I came up with in this study. Um, something I observed uh, that might be quite disquieting for a lot of people is that I did this study with multiple lab fields. Uh, and the reason that I did this is I observed this behavior in all of my specimens where you have this zigzagging behavior in a Zydeval plot on the directions. Note that these are unoriented, but they're all from the same site. Um, and what this is caused by is it's caused by a proportion of the magnetization that's gained in the infield step um, being retained in the zero field step, which deflects the direction towards the lab field, so a PTR and tail. And if you think about this, this will be dependent on the scale of the lab field that you use. And the mad angle will be dependent on the ratio between the ancient field and the lab field that you used. And this is a bit of a problem because most people keep the lab field constant and the ancient field is the thing that varies. <laughs> so there's a, there's a bit of a problem here. So this is the, you know, something in a 10 microtesla field, 30 microtesla field, and a 70 microtesla field, lab field, and you can see that uh, there's a big difference. Um, and so uh, if, you, if you kind of look at the correlation between the perpendicular component of the lab field, because that's what will affect this, um, and the mad angle, you can see that there's a fairly strong relationship. That's these green circles here. Um, and there's one outlier. Um, and if you look at uh, sort of 
just the zero field first steps, which I'm calling mad code, this, this effect is reduced, but it's not completely removed. So there's these PTRN tails can still persist in zero field first steps. Um, so this is something a bit disquieting. I think the best way to get around this is to use multiple lab fields in paleo intensity experiments to avoid these lab field dependent effects. But it's just an observation that I think is important to put out here that came from this study. Uh, a second observation is I sort of tried to characterize my samples a little bit by looking at SEM images. And something I found in my SEM images was this very interesting texture, um, which is sort of this breakdown of olivines into a symplectite iron oxide texture, um, where the sort of resulting uh, remaining olivine is uh, very magnesium rich. Um, and then sort of around it, you get these oxides that have iron, magnesium, and titanium, which is sort of, a, sort of an odd uh, texture. And I observed this in two sites. And the RI plots from both these sites were actually look like this. Um, so basically, everything is a very, very straight line above uh, you know, about 350 degrees. Um, and actually, all of these pass these both really strict Cromwell criteria, and there's 22 specimens from these two sites overall. So this is something that I think might be important to look at. Um, and so I dug through the petrological literature to kind of find out more about this. Um, so actually, this, this idea goes back to a paper by Haggerty and Baker in 1967, where um, they made these things. Um, and basically, every, anything that has magnetite in it uh, occurs above 820 degrees, but there's quite a few different phases that you can form. So this is sort of an example that looks quite similar from an Ejima et al. paper, although they have uh, more magnesium ferrite and some hematite, which I don't think because of our coercivities and blocking temperatures we actually have in these samples too much of. Um, but basically what ends up happening is along fractures, you get oxidation in these olivines, and this occurs at these high temperatures. Um, and then you get this sort of precipitate of a sort of enstatite phase, which is more silicate rich, um, and then an iron oxide phase, which is um, very, very, you know, iron rich. And the resulting olivine is really depleted in iron and very, very enriched in magnesium. Um, so this is just something that I, I sort of wanted to point out because I think it might be something to look for. Um, and so then what we did is we compared our results um, that we got from this study and wait a second, these, these slides are in the wrong order. I edited this at <laughs> two in the morning. Uh, so don't worry about that. But uh, this slide goes first. So these, these are our results. So our results are shown um, it's sort of in the, the non gray plot here. Um, and so the red things are from cinder cones and vent deposits. The purple things are from the lava flows and the pink things are from the dikes. Um, and so we sort of have an average that's similar to the stuff in magic that's in gray in the brunes, about 35 microtesla. But our results that are older than that have an average about uh, 24 microtesla. Uh, and that's quite a lot lower than previous results, which have this sort of big, bigger kind of variance in them. Um, so going back to the previous slide, then what I did is I, I compared these results to two other studies that were done by Hannah Asifo at Scripps. Um, which were in uh, Hawaii and Israel. And, um, <laughs> and I asked Lisa to send me some, some fieldwork photos from this. And she sent me two photos that had her boots in them. I'm not sure what that's about, but I think that's sort of a Lisa joke. Um, <laughs> and so we, we, we reanalyzed these data using the exact same methodology as in this study. So then what I did is I said, OK, we have this temporally sparse data, which Simon mentioned, and how do you get an average from that? Um, and I think that kind of uh, some of the group at Liverpool have been doing something uh, slightly differently, but it's a similar principle where what you do is you construct a curve and you take the average of that curve. And I did this using this Monte Carlo method of Livermore at our uh, 2018. Um, and so Phil Liverpool came up with this method. And, and sort of the important thing about this method is that where you don't have any data, it sort of balloons outwards and you get these huge error bars. Your curves can have a lot of variance in, in where they can go in between times. And so you basically get these large uncertainties where there are no data. 
But even with these uncertainties, when we look at the distribution of averages of all these Monte Carlo curves, um, if you look at sort of last one and a half million years in Hawaii and Antarctica, you actually get a very, very different average VADM, even with this large uncertainty that doesn't overlap. And so even though you, you have few data, it basically shows that you, you can't have the same dipole field as a perfect dipole at Hawaii and Antarctica. Now, how different you actually have to be, um, we only have three locations here. So it's kind of, kind of difficult to say. Um, so sort of in, in, just to go through my conclusions, um, the sort of three things that I observed and found uh, using MAD with a single lab field can cause bias in your pale intensity experiments. So something to be concerned about. Some good news, this high temperature oxidation of olivines might give you good pale intensities. And then sort of the, the final conclusion, which is the data from Hawaii and Antarctic have significantly different average VADMs, even when you compare them using the exact same methodology. Um, but I think we need more locations to understand how non-dipolar the field is and also how the field is non-dipolar. It could be that you have some persistent uh, low flux load during the brunes or something like that. It doesn't necessarily have to be you have this huge quadrupole component. Um, so those are my conclusions. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great talk. And I think my question or comment maybe is about where you compare it. Start with the directional field mm -hmm. that you say is very uh, gap-like in mm -hmm. that. I think it's important to know that those models are based on that and then down to that. Mm -hmm. So basically. Uh, yeah, they were never going to get anything else they got with that damping problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but on my poster, you can see how if you do that, slightly less, <laughs> you do have a uh, non dipole field. So you can get maybe some similar reverse box patches to cause similar anomalies. Yeah. Carl has a question. Given how torturous and time consuming these experiments are, would it not just be simpler to do all of them at a low field rather than trying it at multiple fields? So I think I think that that is for, for this effect, yeah, that, that's a, probably a, a good answer for this. The problem is that if you simulate pale intensity experiments with multi-domain effects, you can find that you know, depending depending on what the parameter you're looking at is having too low a field and too high a field, uh, a lab field can cause problems both ways, right? So with, with low lab fields, you kind of tend to blow up noise in the paleo intensity experiment from what I've seen a lot. Um, and so it's tricky. Um, what you should really be targeting is you should be using the same lab field as your ancient field, but you don't know what that is in the first place. So, so it's good to have a range of Earth-like fields, I think, but I think that help the problem is that then you end up producing a lot more data yeah exactly yeah so yeah i think i've got a question from me no well, then from me okay. <laughs> um so is it you know, your, your lab field goes up um your mind goes up and it's basically telling you that your nrm is contaminated by the lab mm -hmm. It's good, right? That's what we want. We want to know when that's happening. So having a large map is kind of actually useful to see that. Yes, I think that that's a that's a fair thing to say, and it will come up in other parameters in your RI plot as well. Or you know, um, because when you do that vector subtraction, it's not going to be the same amount. The issue the issue is that um, <clears throat> if you say if I if I look at this right. Um, let me go back to these data. So if I, if I look at uh, this relationship between uh, the ancient field and lab field, if this thing had been originally magnetized, so, so, so this, this site, the apparent ancient field of this site is about 15 microtesla. And so if you kind of look at this curve and look at what the man would be at that, actually you'd, you'd be well under your, your five uh, threshold that I'm using for this, but, um, if these rocks were magnetized in a 70 microtesla field, all of these things would pass. 
based on that. So, so it, it is sort of problematic because you could say, okay, that one philosophy is you should be excluding these things because there is this contamination. But then for things that have high ancient fields, you're then, it then gets masked out. So you have the problem in the opposite direction. Um, and so the tricky thing is you, you could do some kind of normalization of MAD, but then the thing that you're actually looking for with MAD is uh, if you have like a, a secondary component or a VRM, or, you know, that's kind of a, a reality check for some auto interpreting things. Um, and that's not going to be affected by lab field. So you have one effect that's lab field dependent and one effect that's non-lab field dependent. Um, perhaps if you extrapolate this relationship back to zero and you look at what the intercept is or something like that, but I, I'm kind of skeptical of that. I, 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 yeah, I've thought about sort of how to treat this, but yeah, it, um, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> it's a tricky problem. Uh, anything else or anything online? A couple of chat messages. Yeah, we just agree to a comment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, that's everything. Thanks, Wyndham. And we'll <laughs>